Hi, my name is Marina Petrova, and I'm here talking to Jim Holt. He's one of the final fives for the National Book Critics Circle Awards in the category of nonfiction for 2012. We're here at the writing program in New York City. Thank you for being here. I'm delighted to be here. I would like to ask you about what Freeman Dyson wrote in the New York Review of Books, saying that the uh, philosophers are more interesting than the philosophy, implying that philosophy is losing its relevance in the current century. What is your opinion on this? First, I should say that I revere Freeman Dyson, a, a marvelous physicist, one of the great physicists of the 20th century, a very good writer, but I think he's utterly ignorant about the current state of philosophy. Uh, philosophy is in not exactly a golden age today, but uh, lots of exciting developments are happening, particularly in the philosophy of science, of which Freeman Dyson uh, is unaware. And so I think that was an utterly unfair criticism. But I, I appreciate the fact that scientists feel that uh, philosophers are maybe a little arrogant toward them. You know, philosophy pretends that it can come into an area and sort of clean up the conceptual apparatus. And, and people understandably, working scientists understandably you know, resent that a little bit. But uh, no, I think, I think philosophy is in a very healthy state these days. Um, great progress in, in made in philosophy of language, the understanding of consciousness, uh, philosophy of science, even interpreting things like special relativity theory and quantum mechanics. So uh, yes, I deny utterly what Freeman Dyson said, but I revere him as a great scientist and a great thinker. Um, could we talk a little bit about nothing? And I wanted to ask you if My you My favorite think topic, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I gathered from the book. <laughs> I talk about nothing, think about nothing all day long. But I uh, wanted to ask you if you think we could ever successfully define nothing, because uh, we're always limited by language. And each time we give nothing a name, do we turn it into something? Yeah, it's the, the trying to envisage nothingness is uh, something that's defeated a lot of great thinkers. Uh, Henri Bergson, the French uh, philosopher of the 20th century, when he tried to, you know, he tried to visualize, to picture, to imagine nothingness, and he, so he could eliminate all of matter and people and space and time, but he was left, left with himself. And he thought, well, I can never get rid of the observer. So in some sense, even if there's nothingness, there has to be an observer, so you can never get to absolute nothingness. And then other you know, philosophers have said, uh, even when you eliminate all the contents of the universe, no stars, no planets, no atoms, no humans, no space, no time, you still have a sort of you know, s empty stage on which they all were. And so, um, yeah, it's, fu it's fun trying to stretch your imagination and to make uh, imaginative approximations closer and closer to absolute nothingness. Perhaps you could never get there, but I do think that the, the concept of nothingness is logically consistent, and so it's possible that there could have been nothing. And so we're sort of lucky that there is something. Uh, yeah, nothingness is a real threat, um, and uh, it is consistent, even if we have problems imagining it. We have problems imagining lots of things. I mean, who can imagine uh, curved four-dimensional space-time? But Einstein's theory tells us that's the world we live in. I can't imagine it, but I believe it. Yeah, I believe it too. Um, <laughs> uh, you write um, somewhat jokingly that God is, um, if God exists, he's 100% malevolent, but only 80% effective. You also write that um, a random reality um, is bound to be mediocre. So could we just say then that if God exists, that he just did a mediocre job with the universe? Yeah, well, the one, the, the, you know, I, the first time, uh, about in, in 1994, I wrote an essay for Harper's Magazine about nothingness. At that time, I made the same observation, but the numbers are a little different. I said, it, it, looking at the universe, you'd think it was created by a being that's 100% malevolent and only 90% effective. And in the book, I changed that to 80% effective, which means that my view of the universe has improved a little bit mm -hmm. uh, over that uh, uh, period. Um, yeah, I mean, the, it's, it's very possible that the um, universe, I, I'm not ruling out the possibility the universe was created by an intelligent being, but if that's the case, it, it might not be a, an all-intelligent, all-powerful, all-good being like the Judeo-Christian concept of God. The world easily could have been created, our world, our observable universe could have been created by a physicist hacker in another universe. And I actually, in my book, mm -hmm. I talked to a great physicist named Andre Linda, who uh, created the theory of cosmic inflation. And he has you know, calculated a scenario in which a, a hacker physicist could have created our universe 
in his lab. And if that's the case, that would explain why our universe in many ways is kind of crummy. I mean, even if you look at the physics that governs our universe, it's not beautiful and elegant. There, you know, there are way too many families of elementary particles. There are you know, Higgs bosons that make everything messier and more complicated. You know, the, 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 the uh, current standard model of particle physics has been called a stick and bubble gum contraption. And it's hard to imagine that an all-powerful, uh, uh, all-knowing God could have created a universe with such a messy set of fundamental laws, much less a universe full of all kinds of evils, like mm -hmm. you know, childhood cancer and the Holocaust and so forth. So, yeah, I mean, I, I do think that, in a way, if there had been nothingness, if there had been absolute nothingness, that would be a more perfect reality than, the, than our reality, because it's perfectly simple. Our reality, it's, it seems to be infinite, but it falls infinitely short of every possible thing. Um, it's kind of messy. It's a mixture of good and evil, of beauty and ugliness, of mathematical elegance and mathematical messiness. So, yeah, to me, it's kind of a cosmic junk shot, I call it. But I guess over the years, um, do you think that if there is a God, he's gotten more experience, so we've raised the percentage a little <laughs> well, bit? Well, one theory, yeah, I mean, the, one theory is that, that God comes in at the, at the very end of the universe, at the, what's called the omega point, uh, when, when uh, human intelligence will have been subsumed into this sort of uh, general cosmic intelligence, and just before the big crunch, you know, the universe began with a big bang, and so one theory is that it will end with the big crunch where the expansion is uh, reversed and everything will implode mm -hmm. upon itself. And so there's a theory that just before the moment of the big crunch, we will have infinite computational power. And or human intelligence or the intelligence that we've been absorbed into will become infinite and will sort of create the universe backwards. Uh, it, it, this is called emanationism in early Christian theology, it's actually a heresy, that the universe mm -hmm. emanates backwards out of this cosmic uh, endpoint. But, um, you know, I, crazier things could turn out to be true. I think it's a fun theory. I think, you know, part of the, the, the pleasure, the intellectual pleasure of cosmic speculation is that you, you get to entertain all of these scenarios they, they, they can't all be right, of course, because they conflict with one another. A lot of them you know, are probably as crazy as they sound, but one of these crazy scenarios may turn out to be to, you know, the, 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 you know, the secret of the universe. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, you know, if you're asking a question like, why is there something rather than nothing, you've got to consider crazy sounding answers to it, because the question's a little crazy. Yeah, and actually, out of all the people that you spoke with on your journey, all the scientists, philosophers, and thinkers, who do you think had the um, craziest ideas? Uh, <laughs> uh, well, a Canadian cosmologist named John Leslie, who knows, who's an excellent philosopher, who knows uh, uh, particle physics and cosmology backwards and forwards. He actually has the nutty sounding idea that the universe exploded into an ex existence out of an abstract need for goodness. It's, mm -hmm. it, it ought to exist, therefore it does exist. And if you want to dismiss this as a, you know, as a nutty idea that was just recently thought up by some guy in Canada, consider the fact that it's essentially what Plato thought uh, you know, 22 and a half millennia ago. And uh, we still consider Plato to be a very profound thinker. So it's essentially an updating of the, of the Platonic scheme. But in order to believe that, first of all, you have to believe that our universe is good or, or it's part of an ensemble of good universes. I'm not convinced of that. And you also have to believe that, that value in itself can be creatively effective. That you know, normally, if something is good, uh, it takes an agent to bring it about. Mm -hmm. And he thinks that, no, goodness itself can bring about a reality. And his, he says, well, you know, if there's nothing to stop the universe from coming into existence, then any reason at all will be sufficient to bring it into, into existence, such as the reason that it's better that it should exist than not exist. So, uh, I, you know, I don't. I think this is uh, uh, implausible. But whenever I tried to make a logical objection to his theory, he always refuted me. So, you know, you, <laughs> he has logic on his side. Yeah, I mean, like you said, anything is possible. So, yeah, as yeah, far fetched yeah. as it sounds, um, who out of all the people that you spoke with were you most compelled by? And I think um, I think John Updike, the uh, the great American novelist who died about a year after I spoke to him, and. After I, I had talked to the greatest physicists, the greatest philosophers, or the greatest cosmologists, the greatest theologians, talking to Updike was almost therapeutic because um, he said, "Yeah, I, I you know, he, he knows a lot about he knew a lot about physics, but he said, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I can't 
wrap my reptile brain around the notion that the entire observable universe, all of these hundreds of billions of galaxies, each of which comprises hundreds of billion stars, was a long time ago compressed into a volume the size of a grape. You know, and, and um, I think you know th th that th his intellectual humility in the face of science, and also his willingness to to take the God hypothesis seriously, but not the vulgar God hypothesis that you know that that is argued about in the God Wars. He you know sees the the, the the universe almost in poetic terms. He conjures up an image of God existing in the sort of uh, surrounded by nothingness and and being bored and summoning the cosmos into existence almost as a bit of light verse and I that just struck me as very beautiful um, and you know and I think that of all the people I talk to I I have the most reverence for um, Updike as a, as a as a creative artist I I love many of his novels many of them bore me but many of them I like <laughs> hopefully he won't hear this no, I <laughs> <laughs> um, and. Um, the, I think the most moving scene, um, and a very emotional scene in your book, the scene of your mother's death. Um, and um, do you think that when we start asking, why does the world exist, why do I exist, it's our own attempt, maybe a failed attempt, to grapple with our own mortality? Yeah, the, when you think about the, the, the contingency, all the almost accidental character of the universe, What's even more contingent and accidental is one's own existence, and you know the fact that each of us won a you know or we're winners of, in, in this sort of cosmic lottery. There there are so many pos genetically possible human beings, uh, and the the human beings who actually came into existence, you and me, and the, you know the other forty billion or so who have ever existed, are an infinitesimal fraction of all of the possible human beings. So why are we the lucky ones or the unlucky ones? Um, and then, of course, you have to, you know, face the fact. I believe that uh, after our biological existence is over, it's nothing. You know, it's it's the same thing that happened before my birth. You know, the the uh, observable universe has existed for 13.7 billion years, and for almost all that time, there was no me and there was no you. And suddenly, we're we're sort of summoned into consciousness, uh, not. Uh, it, exactly against our will, but we certainly don't will our own existence, and we live for a little while, then, you know, we're snuffed out. Um, and so this is, a, you know, as an abstract possibility, I, th I was thinking about death, and I was writing about death as the, you know, the personal imminence of nothingness. And then suddenly, my mother was dying, and it happened very quickly, and, and I do think, you know, so many of us have had the experience of being present when, when someone dies, or, you know, especially a, a mother, a father, someone who engendered our own existence. I was alone with my mother when she died. And it was just amazing to see a self sort of wink out of existence. You know, the, the, the breathing stops, the brain cells are trying to maintain their functioning, but they're chemically unraveling. This little bit of guttering consciousness, which was, was, was my mother, is extinguished and is nothingness. And um, yeah, so it, it impressed upon me anew the sheer weirdness of existence, which I'd become a little bit numb to after working on this book for you know 18 months or so. Yeah, it's interesting that you know you don't deny the existence of God, but then you believe that after death there's nothing. That's um, different from you know from a sta I guess a standard religious view. Yeah, I mean there are actually possibilities for an afterlife that don't depend on the existence of God. Uh, and um, uh, which I get into a little bit in the book. So yeah, I think um, I'm not willing to uh, to. I think you know I hate premature intellectual closure. Mm -hmm. There could be a god in an afterlife. There there could be an afterlife without a god. I think there's neither a god nor an afterlife. But um, you know we we have to keep thinking about these things because you know that's what makes us human. Keep our options open. Uh, yeah, <laughs> our intellectual options open. <laughs> our existential options get closed off as we move towards death, but we can't help that. All right, well, thank you very oh, much. Oh, thank you. It was delightful.